warm welcome to all of you who have joined us for the book talk by Ambassador Peter Westmacott, whose fantastic, they call it diplomacy, is now out. So Peter, you have written a fascinating memoir that pulls the reader in. Knowing you personally, I know what a masterful storyteller you are, and it was just fantastic to see that in writing, you're equally as compelling a storyteller. And you take the reader on this remarkable journey of reflection on your four decades in the foreign office, which began in Iran, included a tour with His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, and concluded with your serving as ambassador to Turkey, to France, and to the United States. You share deep insights about the diplomatic challenges that you wrestled with from working to get Turkey in the European Union to the United Kingdom working to get out of the EU. You share personal tips about how best to go about visiting Machu Picchu and underscoring the importance of wearing a helmet when you're going downhill skiing and you draw richly detailed portraits of key individuals that you encountered along your journey as a diplomat. I want to encourage everyone who is listening to buy a copy of what really is a splendid book. And if you haven't already done so, we've given you a link in the invitation, <laughs> but I know that you will enjoy reading it. I also want to encourage everyone listening to use the question and answer function in Zoom to send me your questions. I have questions that would allow me to talk to Peter all day, but I will refrain from asking them all. And I'm really excited to have all of you be a part of the conversation with Peter Westmacott today. So Peter, let me start by asking you, you know, when I put down this book, what were you hoping the main takeaways for me would be? Well, Karen, let me just begin by saying a huge thank you to you and the GMF team for, for doing this. It's a joy to be with you. You and I go back a number of years. We had fun when you were working in the NSC. I was thrilled when you were appointed to your present position. Uh, we stayed in touch ever since, and we've done our own bit, you and I, one way or another, to try and make the world a, a slightly a safer and happier place. It's always been a joy to be with you. And um, having the chance to talk to you and to other members of the GMF about this is, is a real privilege. So thank you for doing this enormously. I'm too bad we can't be in a bookshop with a glass of champagne and I can sign them all the copies for you, but there we go. This is what happens if you, if you write a book, especially your first book, in a time of COVID, you have to adapt to the circumstances. What did I want to achieve with the book? Well. I wasn't somebody who started a diplomatic career or even ended a diplomatic career saying I've now got to write my memoir and I've got to justify my place in history and I or I'm going to do a kiss and tell and breach some confidences of this or that member of government or the royal family or whoever it is that I've had the privilege of working with. In fact I wasn't going to do any of that um, and I didn't keep diaries throughout my career and didn't really keep many of the of the notes so occasionally I kept travel notes when I'd traveled around the world with a chief, a chief of staff to a politician uh, to somewhere which I would never go to again. And we did so much in a couple of days that I thought I'd forget it. I kept some of that back, but actually very little of that has found its way into the book because I wasn't sure that it was of, of general interest. The reason I really did it was because finishing up after more than 40 years, I'm almost ashamed to say as a British diplomat, and then a few fascinating months, which I really enjoyed at the Institute of Politics and as a fellow of the Belfast Center at Kennedy School in Harvard. A lot of the young people who I thought would want to interrogate me on the details of policy formation and why was the UK doing this or that? And what about the special relationship and the future of NATO and the rise of China? They didn't really want to talk about any of those things. They wanted to ask about becoming a foreign service officer and how do you get in and what's it like and what kind of life is it? And is it fun? Is it stressful? Does your family cope with it? And what do you do when you get instructions you don't agree with? All those different issues, which are the very human parts of trying to be a foreign service officer. So I sat down and wrote a bit of it. 
I also had a few things that I thought were potentially of interest to historians about what happened during my watch in Turkey, because we were there at a quite dramatic time. And there was a lot going on in the political and uh, economic development of that country when I was ambassador there. And then the rest of it was really drawing on a few anecdotes, um, describing some relationships, hopefully not breaching confidences in a, in a way that anybody would mind, to try to explain what does a diplomat do? Does he or she serve a purpose? And then towards the end, to draw a few threads together, reflecting a little bit on modern America, where I've spent eight years as a British diplomat, and also the United Kingdom, now that it's taken this decision to leave the European Union, something which you and I both know personally, I thought was a mistake, a uh, mistake for Europe, mistake for Britain, mistake for a number of broader interests, including perhaps the US interests, but we've done it. And you know, what now? And so I was trying to suggest that there are some opportunities for the United Kingdom, a country which I was proud enough to serve for all those years, to continue to play a constructive and a useful role in the international community. So I touch a little bit on that towards the end. So it was a combination of things, but it was driven very largely by trying to answer the question, what's a diplomat do and, and do we still need them? That's a great overview also of the many topics you touch in the book, Peter, and I wanna dig into those. But first I wanna ask a question about you as a diplomat. And one of the themes that comes through often in the book is the power of anniversaries in relationships with countries. And this also comes up in the chapter about your having served as ambassador to the United States. And one of the anniversaries you touch on is the 50th anniversary of Churchill's death. When you went and you, you go then to Fulton, Missouri to the venue of his famous 1946 Iron Curtain speech. And I just want to read a little quote from the book, and I'm going to do this throughout just to give our, our listeners a flavor of your style. I'm amazed you've read it. I'm very touched. <laughs> <laughs> I loved reading it. So you write, the great wartime leader knew a thing or two about public relations. Churchill had agreed to give the lecture at Westminster College in Fulton on condition that President Truman went with him. As a result, over 40,000 people turned out for his speech. Shortly before arriving at the venue, Churchill asked his driver to stop the car. He fished out a cigar, put it in his mouth, unlit, and asked the car to drive on. Never forget your trademark, he told his traveling companion. And as I read that, I thought, huh, what is your trademark? I know it wasn't a cigar, <laughs> but what was distinctly Westmacott in the way you practice diplomacy? Karen, I absolutely have no idea. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely question to think about, but do you know, I was one of these people who was, uh, first of all, surprised that I became a foreign service officer because you know, I remember feeling in my first year or two how am I ever going to make the grade with all these amazing, brilliant people uh, all around me? And, you know, pleased to survive in, in a sense from one day to the next and just kind of got on with the job. I never um, planned a career, um, but I did. Each time I applied for a job and I was lucky enough to get most of the ones that I did apply for, I did go to a country, um, certainly later in my career, of which I had experience. When I started my career, I didn't have any experience of any of them, except a few months in France as a student before I went to university, where I went to learn the language and, uh, and earn a few francs. But it was, if you like, uh, one thing led to another. And I always tried to go to a country where I spoke the language, knew the culture, felt that I could hit the ground running, especially when I was in a more senior capacity. I don't think I would ever have, uh, asked to be meant, sent as ambassador to a country about which I knew nothing. So, because you spend the first year or two just trying to find out, you know, what, what's the lay of the land? Uh, where's the bathroom? Where's the coat closet? So you need to, um, I think in my case, it was a determined curiosity about uh, the culture, the people, language of wherever I was serving. I was always interested in what made people tick. What was the history? What was the baggage that we Brits had answer an awful lot in many more countries than I had realized because of our uh, uh, past um, as the owners along with many other countries of a, of a large empire. So I think uh, the, 
it was about curiosity and I suppose it was probably about people. Um, people used to ask me, why do you live in these grand houses, which the British government has bought over the years? Uh, and the answer is to put them to good use by bringing people there, hopefully, so that they will not only have a good time, but they will feel it's a useful way of spending a lunchtime or an evening or an afternoon because they will find that it's interesting for them professionally because they will find other interesting people. So I suppose as a diplomat, I like to think of myself a bit as a convener, bringing people together using the tools of the trade that I was given. Uh, and in many places around the world, British ambassadors have fantastic houses. Uh, so there are real tools of the trade. And I finished the answer to this question with a tiny little story. I don't think it's in the book. When I lived in McGill Terrace off Rock Creek Park, uh, when I was first in Washington, I remember I used to have people around uh, to the house for dinner, uh, congressmen, occasionally senators, staffers, Republicans, Democrats. And I took my dog for a walk in the snow one night after having people around for dinner. And I found one Republican, and one Democrat standing in the snow, talking to each other at midnight. And I made some childish comment about, haven't you guys got a home to go to? And the answer was, we only talk to each other when we come to your place. <laughs> so that made me think, okay, there's a role that diplomats can play. And I suppose it's, it's therefore, it's people and it is curiosity about uh, other parts of the world other than my own. I, I will also say, Peter, what struck me in reading the book was how true you were to yourself and the assignments that you went to, you, you, wanted to go to these places because you felt you could make a positive difference. And it struck me particularly when you became ambassador to Turkey. I remember someone senior to you saying, oh, you could do better than Turkey. But you wanted to go to Turkey because you felt you had something to bring to that. And you care deeply about the relationship. And, and that was something that struck me as well, that it wasn't just about, oh, what's the best thing I can get? It was, where can my own skills be put to best use? Um, and I want to come to the special relationship, the US-UK relationship. And the piece of that that intrigued me that I was reading the book, you know, there are lots of reasons it's termed the special relationship, but surely one of them is that Americans and Brits have gone to war together on multiple occasions. And I was struck in the chapter where you were talking about having served as deputy undersecretary for the wider world, which may have been one of the best titles you had, <laughs> um, the wider world, I love that. Uh, and you were talking about your work on Sierra Leone and Britain's military engagement there in, in 2000. And I wanna juxtapose that quote with another one because you're talking about uh, the Brits having undertaken this military action and you say, it was perhaps the last occasion when a foreign military intervention on behalf of a friendly government did exactly what was intended and helped end a war. Tony Blair, the prime minister, was deeply impressed. The Sierra Leone experience was, I believe, a factor in his decision later that year to commit UK armed forces in support of the United States should it prove necessary as he and President George W. Bush concluded it was to take military action against Saddam Hussein in Iraq in the spring of 2003. So, you know, here's a case saying, well, you know, then Prime Minister Blair believed in the utilitary of the use of military force. And I wanted to juxtapose that with a reflection you have much later in the book when you're thinking about the statue that is on the edge of the British Embassy property here in DC, that wonderful statue of Churchill waving the victory sign. And, and you write, um, you know, there he is, one foot on British territory, one on American, two fingers aloft in the famous victory sign. And by his final invocation to members of his cabinet when he left office in 1955, never be separated from the Americans. And, you know, I'm interested in how you think about the Iraq war example, what it taught Britain or, or what lessons Britain learned about the utilitary of military force and what lessons Britain took from this idea of never being separated from the Americans. And how did that play out when later David Cameron seeks and fails to receive parliamentary support for military engagement in Syria. 
but just reflect for us on you know, the lessons that you take from this diplomatic career of yours about the role of military force and engaging in military action with the Americans. Karen, those are amazingly thoughtful comments and I'm thrilled that looking at my book should have prompted some of those <laughs> reflections. Um, one small comment on your, the first thing you said. Um, I think you're right. I did like to go to places where I thought uh, there was a difference that I could make. But I would also say this to anyone aspiring to be a foreign service officer. It is quite often as a biggish fish in a smallish pond that a foreign diplomat is most able to make a difference when something is happening. You know, with the best one in the world, British ambassador in Washington, wonderful job, top of the greasy pole, as we, as we say. There were some moments when I like to think that you know, the ambassador on the spot really did make a difference. But it probably happens less often in those very big posts where there's an entire apparatus of intergovernmental cooperation between capitals than if you are the guy on the ground, the other side of the world, which a lot of people in Hadelpis don't know much about or don't understand or don't care about. And the person there, if they've developed the relationships and they've got the interest and they have convinced the people there that they want the best for that country rather than just to score points off them uh, at their expense. You can, in the most unlikely places, whatever your nationality, make a difference. So you're right, that was part of what was in my mind, but I think it's an observation I would make to people who think I don't wanna go and be posted to the back of beyond. Sometimes the back of beyond is a really important place to be and you can make a difference. On your second uh, bigger question, I do think that um, Sierra Leone was important in Tony Blair's thinking. Not long before that, you may remember, he made a big speech on international intervention at Chicago, uh, which created some headlines. I don't think I talk about it in the book, but uh, people were saying, wow, okay, here is, uh, here is a blueprint for uh, a sovereign nation interfering in other people's affairs when uh, values or human rights or national interests are at stake. And it was quite, sort of out there uh, as a statement of political intent. And then we had um, Sierra Leone, which was short-lived and very successful. And as I, as I write there, you know, it, it did what it said on the tin. And then we ended up fast forward with Iraq. And then you talk about what happened with David Cameron. Well, I think that Iraq, if, if Tony Blair was with us here, he would say that he still believes that the judgment that he made to support the president of the United States in going in uh, to Iraq and getting rid of Saddam Hussein, a bad man was the right one, but he would also admit that, uh, um, that not sufficient preparation was made for the morning after, phase four as the military would call it, uh, of a military operation, and that everybody has a certain amount to answer for about that. He certainly would not believe that any of this was done on a deliberately false prospectus, even if some of the intelligence turned out to be not right uh, after the event. So I think it was it was a searing experience in terms of how it worked out. I don't think, don't want to put words into my former prime minister's mouth, I don't think he would say this shows that it was the wrong thing to do. I think the problem was in, if you like, more the execution. Now, uh, but it did have a big impact on, as you rightly point out, David Cameron. So when at the end of August 2013, um, President Obama picked up the telephone when David Cameron was on the beach in Cornwall in a beautiful little place called Polzeth and said, you know, we've been looking at this serious situation and we have concluded that there needs to be a military response to the industrial scale use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime. And is the United Kingdom going to be with us? He didn't, to be honest, he didn't give us a huge amount of notice of the question, but also uh, I think partly because of what had happened before in Iraq, but also what had happened in Libya, if you remember a couple of years earlier, where we had also taken military action, David Cameron's judgment was that he could not take military action in Iraq without seeking the views of the British parliament first. And we know that, that in the end went wrong. It was, it was supposed to go right. There was a deal which was struck between the two principal parties, but it went wrong on the night. And then later on, even when a relatively modest decision was required about military aircraft of the Royal Air Force taking part in limited strikes in Iraq. Again, he felt he had to go back to parliament to seek approval for something which would have gone through on the basis of what you would call an executive order, uh, but we would not have regarded it as necessary to go to parliament. So I think the lasting impact was that British prime ministers 
from now on, uh, will find it very difficult to take even limited military action without consulting parliament. As for never be separated from the Americans, 1955, Winston Churchill, yes. And remember just one year later, we had Suez. Now in Suez, which was uh, a foreign policy fiasco, frank frankly, for the United Kingdom, the French with whom we were, if you like, together along with the government of Israel who were in, in collusion with us, concluded never again rely on the Americans if you're going to take a foreign policy initiative. And the Brits said never again uh, become involved in overseas military adventures without having the Americans on your side. So that, if you like, underlined Winston Churchill's judgment just a year later in Suez. And thereafter, whether it was the development of military programs, the nuclear deterrent, Polaris, and then Trident, uh, successive British governments have concluded that the right thing for the United Kingdom is to remain joined at the hip with the United States. And that is military, it is defense, it is intelligence sharing. It's a whole lot of other things, which you know about just as, as well as I do, which has been a fundamental part of that relationship. It doesn't mean to say that every time the United Kingdom wanted something uh, from the United States, that it got the right answer. In, indeed, at, at the end of the war, uh, some of the terms of um, ending Lend-Lease and war debt, I remember being kind of indignant that we were still paying more than 100 million pounds a year of war debt to the United States until 2006. Nobody else paid America any war debt, especially the guys who started the war or the guys who lost the war. But the Brits <laughs> were still paying back capital and interest, 100 million a year till 2006. So, you know, it was a special relationship. It is a special relationship. But there were a number of times when we were reminded you could take nothing for granted. And indeed, what the United States government has seen is you can't take it for granted either, unless now the British Parliament is on board too. So it's perfect that you mentioned Suez because it's a wonderful segue for us to talk a little bit about Britain's relationship to France. And the lessons that the two countries drew from Suez are so important for what's happening today as well. And, you know, I want to set the stage for, for our listeners. You know, you arrive as ambassador to France in the immediate run-up to presidential elections in 2007. And you're trying to get the lay of the political landscape. And I want to share a vignette about your first meeting with Sarkozy. So on my first outing, I went to watch Nicolas Sarkozy speaking in a sports hall containing 10,000 noisy supporters in the Western city of Nantes. Looking back, I recall two points in particular. First, Sarkozy's skill as an orator, energy, drive, passion, and conviction, which left him physically exhausted and drenched in sweat. Second, the quite unnecessary kindness of François Fillon, a future prime minister of France, but at the time, just a former minister and senior member of the Sarkozy campaign team. After the speech, he ushered me backstage to the green room where the future president was hovering up a box of dark chocolates, which he later gave up for dietary reasons and made time to welcome me to France and his campaign. And of course, as we know, Sarkozy wins. And in a way, to everyone's surprise, Sarkozy and Gordon Brown worked together quite happily and effectively, among other things, on defense cooperation. And you know, we learn about Anglo-French defense cooperation throughout the book. And you take us also to the far-reaching Lancaster House treaties that Sarkozy and David Cameron signed in 2010. And I want to ask you about what's going to happen now. Britain has always privileged its membership in NATO, and arguably that's become more important now that Britain is outside the EU. But this British-French defense cooperation perhaps is more important to Britain if Britain feels that maybe the United States is less reliable in these matters after four years of Donald Trump. So I would be interested in your sense of uh, how do you see defense cooperation with France moving forward for the UK? Thank you, uh, Karen. My own view is that even before Brexit, that defense cooperation between Britain and France was hugely important. We were by a long way, the two biggest contributors to NATO. 
and I used to get some pretty severe messages from the leadership during the, my time in Washington about burden sharing uh, in NATO. You know, why is it that the United States is paying such a large share uh, of the NATO budget and providing so much of the capability? And it's really important that you Brits and the French should do your bit. And we took that very seriously as, as does France. And so it was always an important part of uh, our contribution to, to NATO. And I think it was uh, almost a part, part of, of special relationship, if you like, with the United States. Uh, the United States expected us and the French uh, to do our bit. And in various discrete ways, the United States and France, despite all the gaullism of the 1950s and 60s, uh, cooperated militarily on, on equipment and testing and so on, just as we did uh, from the United States. And that was quite right since we had uh, very similar interests uh, in, uh, at stake at that time. Now, uh, in a Brexit world and the Brexit negotiations, to my regret really, did not include any provision for continuing structured foreign and security policy cooperation between the UK uh, and the rest of the European Union, which I think is a shame because of that was one of the things that uh, we were most able to do with some of the leading players in the EU. And I think in an informal way will continue. The bilateral cooperation with France, as I was saying, is going to continue, I'd like to think, uh, unchanged. Now, is it because we're not so sure about the United States that we need to do that? I don't think so. Uh, you're quite right to say that the last four years have been a bit of a shock, if not wake up call to a lot of America's allies. There's been a huge sigh of relief around the world, especially within NATO, because President Trump was not a supporter of NATO was quite America first, was quite unilateralist, didn't like the European Union, didn't like international institutions, didn't like the United Nations. Um, and so now we have a multilateralist president who has been around the block a few times, surrounded by some super talented foreign and security policy people who have been directly at the heart of this kind of international cooperation in the past. And so I think they're welcomed back with open arms. But you're right that nobody can be sure that in four years time, we don't take what I would call a step backwards in, into, into a different territory. I, I would hope not, because I think one of the worrying things of, about the change uh, that took place uh, four and a half years ago is that it did me, it gave far too many people the opportunity to say, well, why should we take America at its word? Because America's commitments, its international obligations have been torn up by one president. So anything that this president might promise can be torn up by the next one. So there is that anxiety out there, but I think people are hoping uh, that it won't be like that. Is that the reason why the rest of us, the Brits and the French and the Brits and other serious players in the European Union and people further afield in the Indo-Pacific area should be getting our act together? It is part of it, but it's also because even if America is, if you like, back in, in the way that we, we know and love, it simply isn't reasonable to expect the United States uh, to uh, be the single policeman of the world's uh, international rules-based order. We've all got to play our part in that. And I think that's the case uh, anyway. But the UK, I think, will want to make those relationships with its European partners work well. We haven't got quite uh, the, the structure that we have had in the past, but we are still there in NATO. We still do a huge amount of cooperation with our leading European partners on cyber security and counterterrorism, um, organized crime, uh, series of issues like that. Years ago, when I was first serving in France, we had fantastic cooperation with the French authorities, for example, in dealing with guns being tr transited from Libya through France into Ireland, when we had the IRA uh, busy committing acts of terrorism on a regular basis in Northern Ireland. And the cooperation between us and the French then was, was breathtaking. So I think you know, a lot of those sort of areas of cooperation based on very similar values and, and good neighborliness, I firmly believe will continue, even though we're no longer inside the European Union. And I, I do want to weave in two questions from the audience because they're related to the relationship with France. Um, one is from Diana Negroponte, who is asking how best to resolve the current French hostility to a Brexit UK over fish finance and other tariff issues. And then I also want to add a question for from Laurent Bonnat. In the post-Brexit world, does a stronger trilateral diplomacy between the UK, France, and Germany make sense? So if you could speak to those two points, that would be great. On well, the first one, and Diana, thank you for being with us. Thank you for the question. It's a, Part of the fun of doing these 
uh, kind of conversation is that old friends pop up and you have a chance to feel you're with them even if you're not actually in the same room but it's you know almost it's the next best thing um i think uh, the brexit atmospherics are a bit messy uh, i would say uh, and very much not as a british government spokesman that i think there's been a little bit too uh, much readiness in london uh, in government circles to have uh, somebody else to blame for the outcome which we have now got following the Brexit negotiations. Uh, to be honest, I think that the de detailed negotiations, both leading to the initial withdrawal agreement and then the two years we spent after that working on a, on a, a, a trade and cooperation agreement, were not always brilliantly handled, frankly, from the British side. And certainly we haven't got all those wonderful free trade arrangements, tariff-free, uh, friction-free, uh, and the right to go and live and work and study uh, freely elsewhere in the European Union, which is what a lot of the Brexiteers were promising at the time of the referendum five years ago. That's not the way it's worked out. It never was going to be, because if you were going to do Brexit, why on earth would we be given all the benefits of membership without actually being there and paying our dues to the club membership? So um, that was always, I thought, a nonsense. And so as a result of that, there is a bit of an inclination to say, well, this is a problem and that's a problem. And our truck drivers aren't bringing through enough fresh food and the customs forms are very tedious. Uh, and oh, by the way, uh, there's a problem in Northern Ireland and to blame somebody else for it. Sometimes actually it is a result of the decisions that we have taken ourselves. Um, but it's many, many countries find it easier at times to say it's somebody else's fault. So there's a bit of that. But then there's also, I think, a sense in the European Commission, and I'm sure in some of the capitals, and this has been brought to the surface, unfortunately, uh, by the whole COVID business and, and vaccines, that people are feeling, well, those Brits have gone um, and we're not going to make life all that easy for them. So we're going to apply uh, the new uh, rules of the road, literally, which means that there are some impediments to trade. Uh, and it also means that particularly when on vaccines against the COVID-19, the Brits have actually done rather well because we put a lot of money into a lot of different um, projects to develop a vaccine, a number of which have, have come good. And we are therefore miles ahead of any of the other European countries in terms of vaccinating our population. There is a sense that we have done well. And by the way, some of the vaccines that the British people have benefited from, like about 10 million of them, were made, manufactured in the European Union, whereas we've exported none uh, to the European Union. That is true, but it's not so much because the Brits are being difficult. It is because of the contractual arrangements and the way in which these vaccines are put together in a composite way with components that are made in different countries, different parts of the world, some in the EU, some not. And companies sign contracts, companies supply different governments or different agencies with the, the vaccines that they're making. The United States has done very well with vaccines. Israel has done brilliantly. Uh, we've done pretty well, but the European Union was slow off the mark in placing orders. Uh, and actually the people who have made them have been a little bit slower in getting their products um, uh, certified as fit for purpose. But the sadness of it is that it's led to a rather bad taste in the mouth. There's, there's some, um, uh, resentment, I think, uh, in parts of the European Union towards the UK. And the UK has responded by saying, well, it just shows that we were right to leave the European Union. And a certain amount of nonsense is talked about it. For example, saying that because we've done Brexit, then we were able to do our own thing with the vaccines. It's nonsense. You know, we had every right to do our own thing on vaccines, and we probably would have done by opting out of the European program uh, of vaccination. But it, it's it is used as one of the so-called benefits of Brexit by those who are trying to make political points. So I think it's not as if there's any one way that you can get people to feel um, more helpful towards the UK on, on fisheries or trade or truck drivers or agricultural exports, uh, or the Brits to be more generous, although I think there is an agreement which is close to being finalised, which will provide for more of the vaccines manufactured in Britain to be exported uh, to the European Union. It's more about all of us, if you like, settling down and coming to terms with the reality that Brexit has happened and it is in all of our interest to make it work as well as possible without necessarily um, giving away the stall, but recognizing where our own best interests lie. And I'm very much hoping that over a short period of time, uh, the atmospherics will improve uh, and that it'll look 
less amusing and less good political sport for certain political figures and newspapers in the UK uh, to constantly seek ways of picking fights with our European neighbours. I don't think that's very helpful and vice versa. It's not very helpful uh, if that happens in European capitals either. Yeah. Yeah. And what about should Germany be a part of the way the UK cooperates post Brexit? Germany I think so. Um, we had we had a nice little arrangement which was called the, the E3, which was Paris, London and Berlin, which tended to work very effectively, mainly on foreign policy questions. Um, to some extent that can continue. But of course, we, the Brits, need to bear in mind that other members of the European Union may not necessarily like that sort of exclusive arrangement continuing if London is no longer part of the European Union, if the United Kingdom is no longer part of it. But I think in, in practical terms, uh, let's take, for example, whether we're going to succeed in putting back together some sort of Iran nuclear deal, which was one of the flagship diplomatic achievements of the Obama administration, which the rest of us were all part of. Uh, if, that, if there is to be a European contribution to dealing with that issue, I think it has to be including Britain, France and Germany, because we were three of the co-signatories of what we call the JCPOA five years ago. And it only stands to reason, I think, for the same governments to become involved again. So in many ways, I think, yes, but we must uh, be very careful not to cause gratuitous offense to other European capitals in the process. Mm, great. So Peter, now I'd like to talk about the chapter in your remarkable career where you spent three years working for the Prince of Wales. And one of the things that struck me throughout the memoir is how honest you are. And you're always recounting mistakes or missteps or misunderstandings that complicated uh, things. And a couple of them pop up in, in the chapter about the royal family as well. And the one that I wanted to share right now actually involves the queen. And you're talking about, you know, the queen of course has visited so many countries, many of them several times that she was extraordinarily well informed and never at a loss for conversation, even with ambassadors stricken with stage fright. And you're there to brief her and you write, and she always mastered her brief. I still remember her majesty turning to me before the new Ethiopian ambassador entered the room and asking, since she said the map accompanying her brief wasn't entirely clear, whether the granting of independence to Eritrea a few years earlier meant that Ethiopia was now a landlocked country. To my shame, I had no idea. <laughs> so, you know, that just paints this wonderful picture. And you have many vignettes of your engagement with the Prince of Wales, with Prince Charles, and, you know, one has the sense that you had a very warm relationship with him and overall a sympathetic view of the role of, of the royal family. Now, as you know, Americans are fascinated by the royals. We can't get enough information, gossip, uh, you know, so we quite love this institution called the royal family. On the other hand, I think there's also a sense among many Americans that perhaps the institution has become anachronistic and it's unable to modernize. And maybe a recent example of that would be Oprah Winfrey's interview with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And so I just want to ask your view on how you see the role of the royal family in the 21st century. Well, um, th thanks, Karen. You're, <laughs> it's rather nice hearing my little stories played back. <laughs> no, uh, and I, I had a ball, as you can tell. I, I enjoyed every minute of it. And um, there were moments when you feel you've made a complete fool of yourself, and there are moments when uh, occasionally uh, you get it right. And my role, both as a senior official accompanying uh, advising members of the royal family and the three years that I spent in the palace were, were unforgettable and you know, a, a really an extraordinary uh, a privilege. So, um, I mean, my sense is that over all these years, the, the monarchy has had some, some bumpy moments. You know, we had the abdication crisis of 1936, which was the, the great moment when uh, the, the new king, uh, King Edward VIII, was decided to put the love of his American divorcee, a girlfriend who became his wife, uh, ahead of his duty 
to assume the role of monarch uh, because it, she was not acceptable at that stage as a divorcee uh, as a queen. Now, this was regarded as a great abdication crisis and uh, where does the monarchy go from here? In fact, uh, the, emer the monarchy emerged from it stronger uh, and the way in which King George VI, who was not the one intended to be the king, but he stood in when his elder brother turned the job down, if you like, the way he stayed in London during the Blitz, as did then Princess Elizabeth, I think really cemented the relationship between the monarch and the British people. Many of us have seen the extraordinary movie, uh, The King's Speech, where we saw how he struggled to get over the stammer that he developed as a child. Uh, in order to make those speeches, especially the wartime speeches, which were so extraordinarily important. So I think uh, the, the point I'm really trying to make is that these moments come, and there was another tricky moment when the newspapers all went crazy when Princess Diana died, and the Queen was criticised for staying in Scotland and not coming down quickly, and the flag not being flown at half-mast above Buckingham Palace because Diana was no longer a member of the royal family. You know, all those different things popped up, and moved on. And, and then we had uh, very soon after that, you know, people were saying, you know, aren't we lucky, this extraordinary monarch, unbelievable selflessness and attention to duty. And oddly enough, I think one of the high spots of people feeling the monarchy really has got it was the way in which a somewhat slimmed down royal family were all there in all their splendor in the sunshine at Windsor Castle just three years ago for the marriage of Harry and Meghan, when people really said, you know, here is a modern monarchy uh, fit for purpose and ready for the future. So I think that um, in a rather extraordinary way over the years, uh, the monarchy and, and therefore the members of the royal family have done a brilliant job at remaining relevant, at remaining loved and respected, very widely respected around the world. It is not an accident. There are more than 50 countries which choose to be member of the Commonwealth, of which the queen uh, happens to be the head. It's not the United Kingdom that's head of the Commonwealth, it's the queen and it will be Prince of Wales, Prince Charles afterwards. That's all voluntary. That's because, and we've got 17 different countries who choose to have the Queen as her, as her head of state because she's there and available and ready to do it. And it means they haven't got to go through the process of, of devising their own. So I think it's an extraordinary institution which does a brilliant job. Now, all the stuff, the Oprah Winfrey uh, interview has of course uh, been something of a, uh, I was going to say a stone lobbed into the pond. That's a sort of, you know, childish way of putting it. But it, it's, it's been a, a bit of a shock. I suspect that one of the more memorable parts of that story will be the very brief statement from Buckingham Palace, which said, uh, recollections may differ uh, as to what actually happened and the stories that were told during that interview. And, and indeed, some parts of it already been shown to be kind of not true. The Archbishop of Canterbury, for example, has said, no, it's not true that I married Harry and Meghan in the garden three days before the ceremony at the chapel at Windsor Castle. So there's a you know, series of different bits and pieces of that story, which will be looked at. I think you know, the Buckingham Palace have said, we are going to look at the question of whether there is uh, an issue of racism at stake. You know, I worked for the monarchy for those years. I, I absolutely hand on heart can guarantee there is not a shred of racism uh, in the genes of any of the members of the royal family that I ever met. And I was fortunate enough to meet uh, pretty much all of them. You know, the Queen's attachment to the Commonwealth, the Queen's attachment to uh, the ethnic diversity of this country, same the Prince of Wales, same Prince William, I think is, is heartfelt and genuine. So I found that bit of it uh, disturbing, but also misleading. But it's right that the question should be asked. It's right that people should be looking at some of the lessons that, that may be learned. Maybe there are things that could be done differently. Maybe there are things that we could done better. And I think also the institution is itself always looking for ways of trying to ensure that it is modern and relevant and fit for purpose. You know, I remember frequently hearing the Prince of Wales making that point, you know, if we don't modernize this institution, uh, you know, it's not going to survive. We've, we've got to make sure uh, that it serves a purpose which people uh, wish it to serve. So I think, um, I, I, I'm hearing what you're saying, but it won't surprise you either uh, that I emerged from, from my career as, as a huge fan and somebody who does believe that an awful lot has been done to ensure that the institution does continue to modernize itself. So thanks, Peter. An equally fascinating part of your career was your relationship with Turkey. And you served as ambassador to Turkey 
Um, there are, it, the chapters you devote to that are incredibly rich in terms of the history that was made during that time. And one place where you put a lot of energy and effort was Turkey's relationship to the European Union. And it, you know, it seems to me that that is an area where people mattered and the role you played as ambassador was very important in the result of Turkey opening accession negotiations with the European Union. It was complicated, it's been complicated ever since. And I had a question prepared, but instead of asking my question, I wanna pull in a question from the audience. Yusuf Bulak has asked, a decade and a half on, what do you think about the current state of the Turkey-EU relationship and how, if at all, can it be carried forward? When I was in Turkey uh, as ambassador, which was from 2002 until the end of 2006, it was a time, particularly after the elections at the end of 2002, when Turkey moved rapidly forward from being just a candidate country to one with which, for, for, for whom accession negotiations had formally begun. And that happened uh, while I was there. It happened with quite a lot of support from the rotating UK presidency of the European Council. And it happened because uh, there was plenty of evidence of uh, real commitment by the Turkish authorities to make sure that Turkey was going to meet the criteria for membership of the European Union, which you know, I think we all welcomed. It was, it was dramatic to see uh, a whole different form of outreach on the Kurdish question. It was great to see the abolition of the death penalty. It was great to see measures taken to ensure that human rights more generally and rule of law were fully respected. It was great to see the economy being stabilized after some pretty severe financial and economic crises shortly before I arrived there. Uh, and it was great to see Turkey playing its part in the international community, leading member of ISAF. Do you remember the international force in Afghanistan after 9-11? Um, and doing a series of different things. And also, um, you know, while I was there, finally, but a bit late in the day, perhaps, doing the right thing on Cyprus, which is the last unresolved territorial dispute in the European Union. You know, Turkey and the Turkish Cypriots went along with a plan put together by Kofi Annan, the United Nations Secretary General, finally to resolve the problem between Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots um, with a bizonal political settlement. But unfortunately, the Greek Cypriot side turned it down in, in their referendum after the Turkish, on the same day that the Turkish Cypriot side uh, it supported it. And that was a significant setback. I mention this because it is part of the answer to Yusuf's question, because I think once there wasn't a settlement of the Cyprus problem, it became much more difficult for the accession negotiations to move forward, because guess what? Cyprus was admitted to the European Union as a member state just 10, year, 10 days after a vetoing of the UN settlement plan and thereafter was always able to call on member state solidarity whenever there was an issue relating to a relationship with Turkey uh, in which Cyprus was a part of the debate or, or the treatment of Cyprus or trade with Cyprus or territorial waters around Cyprus or whatever. So it was a tragedy really that Turkey did the right thing on Cyprus, but so close to the date when Cyprus along with nine other accession countries were going to join the European Union uh, that they still went ahead and joined, even though uh, they had blocked the political settlement which the United Nations had put together. And I think that began a process when uh, the relationship between Turkey and the European Union began to unravel, sadly. Um, I'm very pleased that there is now a fresh attempt being made by the United Nations, the United Kingdom, as a guarantor power uh, of the Cyprus settlement of 1960, which is what fell apart in the intervening years, is playing a role behind the scenes. And it would be spectacular if it was possible to find a, a, yet another attempt, uh, a solution to that problem. But in the meantime, I think the relationship is complicated. But it's, it's also complicated because of some of the things that have happened inside Turkey. On the one hand, Turkey has done amazing things like playing host to three and a half million refugees who've come across the border from tragic civil war that's taking place in Syria and it's continued to play a role as an international player whether it's in Afghanistan or in Libya where actually Turkish military intervention I think it's fair to say uh, helped stop a war in, in support of the internationally recognized government of Libya but at the same time we've we've taken we've seen steps backwards in terms of respect for human rights and rule of law 
and the Kurdish question. Uh, and we have far too many journalists in jail uh, in, in Turkey. And I think that it's become much more difficult uh, to make the case for a Turkish membership, which I, I personally regret. The relationship with the United States is, is complicated as well. There's a number of friction points there as well between Turkey and the US. So I think there's, there's a very good reason to try to iron out the differences, whether or not Turkey is going to join the European Union. I always believed that if Turkey met the membership criteria, it didn't matter that much whether it joined or not, because it would be a better and more pros prosperous country as a result of making those uh, reforms and those amendments. And I still uh, think that that is the case. But whether membership itself is around the corner looks, you know, frankly, much less likely. But I do think that much of the progress that was made in the earlier years, um, and some of which I'm afraid has been undone in recent years, uh, it would be very good for Turkey and for, and for the region uh, if some of those issues could, could be resolved or could be put back. I mean, it's, it's, it's not right, for example, that having virtually eradicated torture uh, in Turkey, that there is more evidence than I would like to hear of it being back in use in, in police stations and detention centers. And that can't be right for Turkey and it, and it can't be right uh, for its membership of international organizations like the European Convention on Human Rights. Lots of challenges for sure. Um, I wanna stay on Turkey for a moment because you know, in reading the, your memoir, it's clear that the life of a diplomat is not just eating canapes and living in beautiful houses. Um, you worked very hard. You um, had very stressful situations. You were, I mean, there were, it's not necessarily a glamorous life in many ways, but I felt that probably the most terrible experience of your diplomatic career took place in November of 2003, when there was a suicide bomb attack on the British yeah. consulate in Istanbul. Um, it was heartbreaking to read about your colleagues and others who were killed and those who were injured. Uh, you wrote that there had never been such a terrorist attack on a British diplomatic mission. And I wanted to ask you how that attack changed you as a diplomat. How did it change your relationship with Turkey? Did you actually find yourself throwing yourself more into the diplomatic work you were doing there as a way to heal and move on? But I wanted to give you a chance to talk about that experience. Well, it was, um, it probably was the most painful moment of my diplomatic career. Um, came out of the blue and within the space of five minutes, we had two very large terrorist bombs, one against HSBC's headquarters uh, down the road in Istanbul, and then car bomb attack on our own consulate general, which was a historic building full of extraordinary uh, memories and bits of diplomatic history, uh, and which did kill 12 of my staff, including the consulate general and his secretary, and three passers-by. And it was a, a very large bomb uh, in a pickup truck. Now, um, I think in terms of my attitude towards Turkey, and it wasn't just because uh, I think not that evening, but the next day it must have been, um, Prime Minister as he then was Erdogan and many members of the cabinet came around to see me in our temporary digs. Our temporary digs, by the way, were the United States Consulate General, which you had recently vacated, uh, moving to a more secure building further up the Bosphorus, but it was empty at the time. and. Part of the special relationship, if you like. My friends in Istanbul said, look, uh, if it's of any help, why don't you take our place temporarily? Which we did, but not for very long because of the security reasons and, and so on. But it was a wonderful gesture, which I hugely appreciated. And um, Prime Minister Erdogan came to visit me and my colleagues there. And we sat in the kind of chaos of it all and, and discussed it um, and where we go from here. I mean, my sense was that, first of all, there was a wonderful, as, as you would expect, um, outpouring of sympathy from, from my Turkish hosts. My second view, having been through all the Northern Ireland experience, but also we, we'd all been uh, witnesses to terrorism in different parts of the world, was that your response to these things cannot be to reward the terrorists. And so part of my response was to say straight away, um, my vacation is taking place in this country, my family are going to be here, and I have absolutely no intention of changing any of those plans, and I look forward to enjoying um, next summer in this country with my friends and relatives. And there were a few other events coming up on the international calendar, which I think Turkey appreciated that the United Kingdom was con continuing to give its, its support for. So in, in that sense, I think part of what you do 
is to uh, is to rally round in the cause of not allowing the terrorists to win. And I think that's something which resonates with all of us. As far as I was concerned, um, I think it, I don't think it really changed my view towards Turkey because uh, in later years, even after I'd left, there were a series of, of horrendous big terrorist attacks over sort of three or four years until sort of 2012, 2013, 2014, some related to Syria, some not. And Turkey has often been on the receiving line and on the receiving end of these kind of events. It is in a very volatile part of the world. And one of the reasons why I always thought it was such a critical country was that I believed it was uh, a haven of stability and of democracy and of secularism uh, without in any sense disrespecting uh, the Islamic religion and tolerance towards all the other minorities and religions which were part of, if you like, the residue of the Ottoman Empire. This was something worth preserving and worth engaging with, apart from being a very big country of 85 million people with, with extraordinary human capital. So I think all that, if you like, was, was, was in my soul to some extent already. But what it did show me was just how difficult these kind of events are. You have to deal with anger and grief and resentment and human beings who feel that somehow they shouldn't have survived when the person next to them lost their life or somebody who wasn't there by chance and, and, and should have been or somebody who would have been there um, if the same thing had happened 24 hours earlier. And then you have to take a great deal of care about those who are still there. You can't just bring in wholesale a new team and say, okay, you take over. You've got to take care of the sensitivities of others who are still there and feel a very acute sense of responsibility to those who, who suffered and, and who are their colleagues, some injured, some not. So there's a whole series of different issues around there, plus a requirement which we have all been through to ensure that diplomatic missions around the world are made as safe as they can be against the recurrence of that sort of uh, terrorist outrage. So it, it certainly changes the priority that you give to physical security, which you know, until something like that happens, you regard as a bit of a bore sometimes. And then it brings home to you, this is real. Um, and it also means that you've got to pay top attention to international security issues, the whole issue of terrorism. Today we're talking because, touch wood, you know, in some parts of the world there's been less terrorist uh, activity than there was uh, just a few years ago. We're talking of different sort of offences. We're talking of cyber offences. We're talking of pandemics. We're talking of different kinds of threats that we're having to address. And that's absolutely right that we should adapt. But we can never take our eye off uh, the danger that at some point some other person with a nasty bomb, whether it's a pickup truck or some other kind of dirty weapon, will get lucky again. So we can't lower our guard. So Peter, the hour has flown by and I wanna close us out with a question to you about the role of global Britain. You've been clear in this conversation, you were not someone who supported the UK leaving the EU. Uh, in fact, in the book, you call it an act of collective self-harm, but you also have been clear that the deed has been done and now we have to make the best of it. And one of the through lines in the book is Iran. You started your career there, that was your first posting, and your last posting in Washington, you feel that a place where British diplomacy and you as ambassador made a real difference was the work you did as part of the P5 plus one on the Iran negotiations that resulted in the JCPOA. Um, and it was so interesting to learn that as you ended the ambassadorship in Washington, there was a moment when you thought you might be going back to Iran, <laughs> that the British government might deploy you there. And you write in the book, I was getting ready to leave Washington at the end of 2015. Britain was having bureaucratic problems with the Iranian authorities over restoring relations to ambassadorial level after the trashing of the ambassador's residence by a Tehran mob in 2011. So I volunteered to return to Iran for a couple of years to unblock things. And then later you write, it was too bold an idea for the FCO. So it <laughs> didn't happen. Now, you know, you can use Iran as the example. I mean, certainly we're all facing the question of, okay, what should the next step with Iran be? And you have a Biden administration that's open to rejoining the JCPOA if Iran upholds its part of the deal. But I, I don't wanna just ask you about Iran. I wanna ask you if you think the foreign office needs to be bolder in this error 
when the UK is not a member of the EU and is still trying to have arguably an outsized impact on the world. So over to you. Hmm. Well, I made that suggestion right at the end of my career. It's partly what you were saying earlier on, Karen, that in this business, it's always more rewarding to go somewhere where you might be able to make a difference. And it just occurred to me, and I bounced the idea off one or two of my American diplomatic friends who thought it was, it was very appealing. We were stuck at the time, we're not stuck anymore. We've got an ambassador there and the, and the moment has passed, but we didn't have an ambassador there and there were some issues. And I thought it might be flattering, not because it was me, but because I was a very senior ambassador who I would to go back. I'd learned the language when I was younger. My wife's Iranian American, as you know, her, my late father-in-law was a respected figure, non-political uh, philanthropist in that country. And guess what? I thought that it was also uh, an area where the United States, which hasn't had a diplomat on the ground in Iran for 40 years, you know, might like to have somebody who knew Washington, but also knew there, who was out there and could help to represent, explain, possibly even monitor the implementation of our new deal. So I had a lot of reasons why another country, which is you know, quite close to my heart, I thought I might be able to go and do something useful there. So it, um, it, it, it didn't happen. Um, I think from the United Kingdom's point of view more generally, I'd like to think, and this is beginning to happen, that there are people who've got some diplomatic experience or relationships or knowledge, languages, whatever, uh, who can still play a role, even if they're not formally in the structure on the payroll, if you like, of the foreign office. Um, there are people who are trade envoys for this or that country. We've got designated people who, who've tried to solve the Cyprus problem in the past, who were, if you like, retired ambassadors brought back to fulfill a specific uh, function. We've had a special representative on Yemen in the past. Yemen was previously a British protectorate, and so there's a historic responsibility there. So I think there are a number of international topics where I'd like to think that the United Kingdom uh, can uh, still make a difference, either through, if you like, conventional diplomacy, the British Foreign Secretary, the British Foreign Office, its, its own staff, or perhaps by using individuals, um, just like the United States does. You've got a special envoy, for example, for Afghanistan. One of the most immediate and tricky foreign policy decisions that the Biden administration has to address, who, funnily enough, is both an ethnic Afghan and was a special representative of the Trump administration and is still a special representative for Afghanistan for the, for the Biden administration, which is a rather extraordinary degree of continuity, perhaps showing that something like Afghanistan is, is a problem which transcends uh, political party issues, even in Washington, which is uh, which is saying something. And I like to think that the, the United Kingdom can and could uh, continue to play that sort of a role in parts of the world where we've got uh, some history, some background, some individuals who can help and where you know, a bit of track to or a bit of unofficial diplomacy can sometimes help because individual governments can sometimes get stuck because there's either demands of reciprocity uh, or there's something that one government wants and it, it won't give it unless the other government moves. Somebody who is neutral, but deemed to be uh, well-intentioned and respected by all sides can make a difference. So is that part of global Britain? Is that part of the United Kingdom rediscovering an international role after being somewhat off the pitch, if I can put it like that, over the last five years while we wrestled with, with Brexit? I like to think the answer is yes, but we've also, we've already moved forward. I'm mean, not many people know, for example, that I think I'm right in saying every single one of the six most senior ambassadors that we have in the world is now a woman. Uh, you know, that's a change. It wasn't like that even just a short time ago. It certainly wasn't like that when I was in Washington. <laughs> so, you know, we've got ourselves a bit modernized, up with the times, a uh, bit more diverse, bit more inclusive. And I like to think that, as we search for a new role outside the European Union, uh, that we can find other ways of making a difference. Well, Peter, thank you for writing this thought-provoking book. I hope you sell lots of coffee. <laughs> thank um, you. But, but more importantly, thank you for your over 40 years of service. You surely have been a force for good in our world, and we Americans are indebted to you for that as well. So lovely well, to spend this hour with you and thanks so much to everybody who joined and sent in such great questions. Karen, for your friendship, your support and, and the tremendous fun that we had working together, a big thank you to you and for the work that you now do 
uh, with GMF and so many other friends, known and unknown, who are on this call. Um, I do appreciate the interest they're showing in the subject. And if somebody wants to buy the book, well, that's even better. But in any case, it's been marvelous to have this conversation. Thank you for the treat of giving me the opportunity. Oh, all right. All best. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.